Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, and the presentation you're about to see is the one that I would have done at the Senior Center, uh, but for COVID. Um, if, uh, this one is about giving. I talk about a bunch of things. I talk about the myth of the $15,000 per year per person limit on giving. There really isn't one as a practical matter. I talk about giving as a way to avoid estate tax and giving as a way to avoid probate and giving just in order to hear people say thank you. So if you have any questions regarding any of this, um, please give me a call at any time. Um, my direct line is 508-860-1470. Thank you and happy holidays. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Now, I know that's not the usual way I start my seminars, but you know, it's the holidays. And so it's December and we're thinking now, we're in a holiday mood, whatever your holiday is. And I want, but I wanna to talk to you about something that always comes up during the holidays, which is giving. Because everybody right now is asking you to give, right? You're getting those letters in the mail from everybody and you're going to the shopping and it's all great. But I wanna to talk to you about giving um, um, if you're Frank and Mary and you're older and just giving from an estate tax and from an estate planning perspective. So this is all about giving. So um, once again, I'm gonna talk about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. You've always heard me talk about them and their goal which is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And after they die, they wanna leave all their assets to their kids. So in this presentation, we're gonna assume that Frank has died already, uh, but that Mary is still alive and that she still has the same assets and the same estate plan. She wants to leave everything to her three kids equally. Um, and these are her assets. She's got her home, which we're saying is worth $400,000, which for my folks who live around uh, here in Marlboro seems pretty reasonable. For my folks who live in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, those aren't the same numbers, as you know. Um, but anyway, we're assuming that house is worth $400,000, but this is going to apply to everyone. Um, it, we'll pretend Mary has an IRA of $500,000, uh, a savings of $300,000, and an annuity of $300,000 for total assets of $1.5 million. And now it's the holidays. Mary's you know, going to be seeing Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and the grandchildren, and all those other people. And one of the questions that often comes up is, so why not give them something? Why not give them something now? Now, there are two kinds of things that you can give them. Well, actually, there were the three kinds of things you can give them. There are the things that they don't want. Those are all the things around the house that you think may still have value, but they really don't anymore. You know, the, what, what, what is referred to in the business as gray, uh, brownware, the furniture, all of that jazz, you know. There were the things that they do want, right? Not because they're being acquisitive, because, but because they remind the kids or the grandkids of you. So it might be a piece of jewelry. It might be a book. It might be just you know, any number of things um, that they're, they are, maybe they've never said anything because they don't, don't want you to think you're about to die, you know, but that they've, they've said, well, you know, grandma or meme or pappy or whoever, um, when you die, I'd really love that, right? So you know, you may want to think about, this may be a great time to give them that to give them that because you know, you, you, you're gonna, you get to hear them say thank you, right? Which is a wonderful thing. And they get to say thank you, which is really a gift to them. I remember hearing that there was an old uh, Arab expression, giving honors the giver, giving honors the giver. So there were the things they don't want, there were the things that they do want. And then of course, there's always money. Um, and folks will say, well, you know, I, I, you know I'd like to give my, my kids something and certainly they're gonna inherit it when I die. And in the meantime, Traditionally, I've given them things. I've given them a check every um, winter, but of course, I, I can't give more than $15,000, right? Because there's a, there's a maximum on how much I can give. Well, no, actually there isn't. There is not a maximum on how much you can, you can give. This is the, of all of the things I tell people when they come in, when they're doing estate planning, what astounds them the most is this. They're all positive that there's an amount that if they give more than that amount, something really bad happens, right? But there isn't. So let me explain to you, therefore, how that works. Because many people won't believe me. Last year I did this presentation or something similar, and I got calls from people saying, you know, I just want to correct, you know, you made a mistake in your presentation. You know, there, there really is this gifting uh, cap. So anyway, 
Um, first of all, there is no Massachusetts gift tax. Second, the receipt of a gift is not income. Often people will say, well, you know, if I give my kids any money, well, you know, or, or stock, or even the house, will they, won't they have to declare that? Won't they have to pay a tax on that? And the answer to that is no. Because the receipt of a gift, like the receipt of an inheritance, is not income. Not only aren't they paying any tax on it, they don't have to report it any place. Okay? So you can give as much as you want at any time, and, and, there's, and, and there's no, for, there is no, for Massachusetts purposes, there's no gift tax, and the receipt of a gift is not income. The, the, the origin of this $15,000 myth is the federal system. Uh, at the federal level, there was a combined estate and gift tax system. And the way that system works is that you, if you have more than a threshold amount, which, which as of this moment is still a little over $11 million, there has been a lot of conversation about re the reduction of that uh, during this year. And as I tape this show, the House of Repres the Congress has just passed, or the House of Representatives has just passed a version of the Biden bill, which is now going to the Senate. I don't know how that's ultimately going to come out, so you know, kind of stay tuned. But in none of that, those versions have I heard that this estate thresh tax threshold is going down below about seven million dollars. So the point is, there is an estate tax threshold above which you pay a very high estate tax, um, but it's very the threshold is very high. Um, there is also, when, when the federal government designed their system, um, they were trying to deal with a loophole in the, in the Massachusetts system, for example, which is literally you can give everything that you own away the day before you die, thereby reducing your taxable estate uh, to zero and eliminate any, any Massachusetts estate tax. So at the federal level, they wanted to keep that from happening. And so they basically, they said in addition, to the estate tax, we're going to have say there's a gift tax, but the gift tax is subject to two huge exclusion or to two two exclusions, one of which everybody knows, one of which no one knows. The one everybody knows was that there is a maximum an amount that you can give per person per year, which there which is therefore excluded from the gift tax, and that amount used to be ten thousand dollars, but but there's an inflation provision in the law, <clears throat> which has increased it over time. And you can imagine, that's why the law's been around for a long time. So it's increased over time, and now it's $15,000, 50% higher than it was originally. And everybody knows that. Then there's the second one. In, above and beyond those, those $15,000 per person per year exclusions, you have a lifetime exclusion equal to the estate tax threshold, which right now is $11 million. But even if it goes down, it's going to get down to like maybe $7 million. And so the, the way the threshold works is, you know, uh, before you pay any gift tax, you, really, you count up all of those little 15,000 ones, and then you count up all of the gifts you made during your lifetime. And as long as those gifts are less than $11 million, there is no gift tax, okay? So there is no limit to the amount that you can give. So you remember, you, you're right now you're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm gonna do these $15,000 checks to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. at the end of the year? Well, you know, depending on your, your financial situation, you can make that $50,000. You can make that $100,000. I have a client, I have some clients who talked to me because they had um, $4 million in assets. They're doing fine. Um, they have two sons, and they wanted to make big gifts to their sons. And I said, fine, give them each a million dollars. They looked like, you can give, I can just give it to them? I said, yes, you can just give it to them. So whatever amount uh, you want, you can give to them. And boy, are they going to be surprised if they open up that envelope and they thought they were going to see $15,000 and they see a hundred, like, whoa, these smoke. So the point is there's no limit to how much you can give. Um, finally, <clears throat> there, people will tell me, well, you know, there is, you know, maybe, maybe I, if I give over this $15,000, there is a requirement that I file a gift tax return isn't there. The answer to that is uh, yes and no. It's yes if you're a real rule follower and you just want to file these forms no matter what and even if there's nothing wrong with not filing. But if you don't care about that, there's no reason to file. And the reason for that is the penalty for not filing a gift tax return 
is not a particular amount of money. It's a percentage of the gift tax you would have owed when you filed that return. But unless you, you exceed one of those, those, ex, those, both of those exclusions, including the one for $11 million in lifetime gifts, until you get there, you don't have to file a gift tax return because there's no penalty for not filing one. So there is no penalty. So right now, or any time before you die actually, you can give your kids as much as you want. Okay? There are a couple of, 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 of things that you want to be thinking about when you're making those gifts. I'm going to mention those a little later. Um, but the other advantage of giving things away before you die, or one of the advantages is probate avoidance. Because whatever you have already given away is never going to go through probate. But you may be in a situation, like most people, where you really don't want to be giving things away right now because you may need them. Maybe you don't want to give away your house, right? Maybe you don't want to give away all of the money that are, is in your bank accounts. Well, so once again, assuming that this is, the, the, your, this is Mary's situation, I'm going to use her as the example for how to think about these things. There are a couple of things that you might do short of simply giving things away. Um, first of all, regarding uh, your house, you could keep, w when you say you own your house and, and you know, you, you what is the house? The house is the ability to live in it, right? And the control that you have over the house so that it's still your house. So you want to keep that for as long as you're alive. You really don't care about, you don't need to be keeping that after you're dead because you're going to be dead. So one possible way of dealing with this, um, would be dealing with the house, would be to now give away something called a remainder interest in the house. That is, the interest in the house that kicks in the, the day that you die. These are called, they're called vested future interests. Um, they are interests that only show up later, but they get vested now because you've already transferred the interest. What, one of the things that Mary could do is she could give a remainder interest right now to her three kids, keep the life estate, keep control of the house as long as she's alive. But if she does that, then at the moment of her death, her life estate evaporates leaving the kids with the remainder interest, and the property never has to go through the probate process. The only time that probate is necessary is if you leave assets that are only in your name so that there is, it's, it is needed to figure out who gets what. And that's the point of probate, to figure out who gets what. And, but probate, the problem is that it takes a long time to get through probate because before anybody can get anything that get, goes through probate, um, <clears throat> creditors have to be paid and creditors have one year from the date of your death to file a claim against the estate. And so the point of avoiding probate is to avoid that one year delay that typically has to occur before any assets can get distributed. Uh, by the way, doing things the way that I'm now describing them also avoids creditors so that if you die with credit card debt, for example, or student loans, I have a couple that had signed on to their grandchildren's student loans and there's still a lot of money left to be paid because some of them never paid it back. All of those debts get wiped out when you die if, if nothing is going through probate. So you could give away this remainder interest in the house. Regarding bank accounts, you could keep the bank accounts, but simply add somebody as a joint owner of the bank accounts. You could add your kids as the joint owners. And you may say to yourself, well, you know, but you know, one of my kids is not doing so well, and what if there's a divorce? And, and, and there are a number of those kinds of issues, right? And so this may not be a solution for you, right? Another solution that, that some people will use will be to, would be to actually create a trust. Uh, and you would name yourself as the trustee of your trust, and then you would say that the kids would be the, the, successor, uh, the successors after you died. The point is there are, there are, there are ways of handling this, right, um, so that you can keep control while not ne necessitating probate after you die. Um, but a second way of doing that um, especially regarding the bank accounts, uh, it would be talk to the person whom you've named in your power of attorney. Now you've heard me say many times that for a senior, uh, it may be that you need a will, it may be that you need other estate planning documents. You have to have a power of attorney, you have to have a health care proxy. You have to have those two things so that if you become incapacitated, there is somebody there who can handle your financial affairs through the power of attorney and who can make medical decisions through the healthcare proxy.
But the other benefit of having that person have your power of attorney is that if you are frail, if you're close to death, at that point, or ideally before that point, you can tell that person who has the power of attorney, look, if I am close to dying and you think I'm not going to need these assets anymore, just distribute them. Distribute them before I die. Because as long as the assets are distributed the day before you die, it can actually be the hour before you die, but you don't want to go there. Um, as long as the assets are distributed the day before you die, those assets are not going to end up going through the probate process. Now, uh, if you are distributing the assets the same way that the assets would be distributed under the terms of your will, um, then I would say just tell the person with the power of attorney to do that, that'll be the end of it. If you want to distribute assets in a different way, if you want, I, I, I have this situation right now. I have an a, 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 a older lady who is dying and she has a will that names a whole bunch of people, uh, except that over the last several months prior to her death, um, their, prior to her impending death, there are some people who have really helped out, who have helped her out a lot, right? And so she's told the person who has the power of attorney, you know, I really want to give something extra to these people, right? Well, uh, that, that's all well and good, uh, except that this may really irritate some of the people who are actually named in this lady's will and who end up not receiving things as a result of the fact that the money's already been given away. So if you're, if you're, if you're not following the, the strategy that is in your will, you may want to put something in writing, right? Expressing the reason why you've asked the person who, is your, your, who has your power of attorney to make these early distributions. Uh, <clears throat> or even better, say something in your will or change your will um, to, to indicate that all of these transfers are, are going to happen. That, will, that would also be beneficial, by the way, if you have joint bank accounts. One of the, the probably the most common family feud that I have to deal with is the feud between uh, people who, have, who, have, who are on, su survivors who are on joint bank accounts, whether it's a surviving child or a niece or a nephew, <clears throat> versus the people who are, 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 were named under the will or the person who is the named executor or personal representative who is managing the will saying, oh no, that, that, you know, when auntie died, she wasn't really intending that you get all that money. Your name was only on there as a convenience because you were helping her without with her finances or whatever. So you can help clarify all of that by saying something about that in your will, by saying, for example, that, that, any, that, you have, that any accounts on which you've named someone jointly, it was your intention that those people actually got all of the money after, the, after you died. So uh, the point is you can think about this ahead of time. It's going to help. It, obviously, people you know, appreciate getting the money, but it's also going to help avoid the expense of the probate process and even more importantly, avoid all of the delays of the probate process. Um, finally, there is, I shouldn't say finally, then there is estate tax avoidance. A lot of people do a lot of this giving in order to avoid estate tax. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that I'm going to talk to you about early on. Under the Massachusetts estate tax law, anything that you've given away before you die is not included, is not taxable, is not taxable. And so I want to talk a little bit about, that, about how that works. So gifting to, to reduce or avoid the Massachusetts estate tax. So to understand how to avoid the estate tax, you need to kind of understand a little bit about the estate tax. So the way the, the estate tax system works is if you die, um, first of all, someone calculates the estate tax for you. If you have a will, it's the person named uh, as the personal representative under the will. Um, if not, it can be any number of other people who actually file the estate tax on your behalf uh, or on the behalf of the estate. Um, but the way that you would figure out what may be owed is, first of all, you calculate the taxable estate. Now, I want to emphasize, because once again, there's a lot of myths around this, that the, the, the taxable estate and the probate estate are not the same. You can structure things so as to completely avoid probate, as I was just suggesting in the case of, uh, of uh, Mary. 
But all of those assets that were jointly owned or where there, was a, where there was a retained life estate or even other assets that might surprise you like the proceeds of a life insurance policy, uh, all the jointly held assets, all of these assets may not go through probate but they're part of the taxable estate. So to figure out your estate tax, you calculate the taxable estate. <clears throat> what you then do is you look at the chart that was developed, oh, at this point, maybe almost 100 years ago, uh, the chart that was developed to figure out how much is owed in estate tax. And then you look at the alternative tax. <clears throat> what does that mean? So here's the chart. This is the same chart that's been in effect in Massachusetts just forever. And it talks about how the estate tax gets calculated. So if you, under the chart, uh, if you are considered to be, have such a big estate that it's worth charging you an estate tax, if your estate is worth more than $40,000, so you can just imagine when this chart was done. It was done at a time when $40,000 meant you were a rich person. I always found that kind of astonishing until I realized that when my parents bought their house in 1940, they paid $2,000 for a two-family house and were scraping to pay the mortgage on that house. So, so the, 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 if, it's, if, the, if there's any, if there's any, any, anything from zero to $40,000, there's no estate tax. From $40,000 to $90,000, there's a small estate tax. And the estate tax goes up gradually from then on so that if you have um, more than $10 million, the estate tax on that money uh, is 16%. So the estate tax keeps going up. So for purposes of this chart, if you had an estate of a million dollars, your estate tax would be $36,560. But wait, you know, you've, you know, you've, you have heard or you, you know, you've, you've been told that if you have an estate of less than a million dollars, there isn't any estate tax. The reason for that is that over time, after this chart was developed, values of things went up, especially the values of houses. And as a result of that, there was pressure on the legislature to make sure that everybody who had a house that was worth, you know, $100,000, $50,000, didn't end up having to pay an estate tax. And so over time, to adjust for that, what they could have done was they could have actually changed the estate, the, the estate tax chart, but they didn't. Instead, they simply increased this, this, um, this amount below which you didn't have to pay an estate tax. And, it, and at one point it went up to 100, 500, 600 thousand dollars. They went up to a million. And that number has been a million dollars ever since. But then the question became, so if, if, when they did that increase, what if you had a dollar over? What if you had a million and one dollars? Well, then what would your, your estate tax be? Because once again, if you, have a, if, you're, if you have a million dollars using this system, you pay no tax at all. If you, if, but if you're over that number, what happens is this million dollar exemption starts disappearing. And the way that it disappears is through this alternative tax calculation. You, when, when the, your estate tax gets calculated, if, it's, if the estate is over a million dollars, you calculate the alternative tax. And the alternative tax is 40% of all of the dollars over a million. So if you have a million and one dollars, you owe 40 cents. If you have a million one hundred thousand dollars using the alternative tax, you owe $40,000, right? And, and so what you do is you do that calculation and then you compare the two. You look at the tax that would be paid under the chart, you look at the tax that would be paid using the alternative tax, and you pay the lower tax. So going to Mary's example, Mary has an estate of $1,500,000. Using the chart, and I won't show you the math that gets that get you there, but using the chart, her estate tax is $68,240. Using the alternative tax, her estate tax is 40% of all of the dollars over a million. Remember, her, she has a million five. 40% of $500,000 is $200,000. So you compare the two numbers, you pay the lower one. So in this case, Mary pays only $68,000 in estate tax. Now, if you want to gift your way out of the estate tax, if you want to gift your way out of, uh, you to the point where you can use the alternate tax, that is, by getting your estate down to a million dollars or less. You have, to, you, you, you have to make those gifts in chunks that are less than $15,000 per year per person. So in Mary's case, 
it would take her 34 gifts, 34 gifts to different people in different years, because you remember the, it's $15,000 per year per person, to get her from a million five down to a million dollars. So it may be that unless Mary is really planning this ahead of time for a long time, she can't get there. If she can get there, the advantage of this strategy is that once she's below a million dollars using these kinds of gifts, her estate tax is zero. But, but that's the only way that she can get to use the alternative tax. The alternative though, in order, in order, to, under the, in order to reduce your estate tax under the chart, under the chart, all you, you can give away your money literally the day before you die. So, so say, say for example, using these, this example, Mary keeps her house, she keeps her IRA because there are some disadvantages to, to giving away those funds early. And then she says the other $500,000, or excuse me, the other $600,000, this money from the savings and from the annuity, I'm just going to give it away. So instead of when Mary dies, at leaving a, uh, if she leaves a million five, her estate tax is $68,240. If Mary has given away the $600,000 and dies with an estate of only $900,000, her estate tax is only $30,960, she has saved $37,280. She's cut her estate tax more than in half. So the point is, you can use these strategies to substantially reduce the estate tax. Finally, uh, asset protection for mass health purposes. If Mary gives away these assets, at least five years before she goes to a nursing home, uh, when she goes to a nursing home, those gifts are not going to be counted against her. If she gives them away within that five-year period, um, that those gifts may cause a period of ineligibility. So that if she's doing it for those purposes, excuse me, um, she needs to be planning ahead. But her basic strategy would be very simple. She's got that $1,500,000. If Mary gives away her assets and wait, waits five years, then those assets are not going to be countable or lienable if she eventually needs to, to qualify for mass health. The typical way she would do that would be by creating an irrevocable trust, a trust w from which she cannot take the assets back when she's put them in. She'd name the most trusted of her kids as the trustee. The result would be she would have avoided probate regarding those assets. She will have minimized her estate tax. And finally, those assets will be safe, non-countable, and non-lienable if she eventually needs to qualify for mass health. So once again, it's the holidays. If you want to give, you can give as much as you want. You may want to think about either in the short run or in the long run, also using that gifting strategy in order to minimize the likelihood of probate or eliminate it, right? Or in order to minimize your estate tax and to protect those assets so you don't inadvertently at some point give a huge gift to the nursing home. So, if you've got any questions on any of this, this is my contact information. You can find us on uh, YouTube and Facebook. Um, the goal of all of this planning is peace of mind. So if you're lo not losing sleep about this, don't worry about it. If you are losing sleep, you should talk to somebody about it. Once again, that's my contact information. Happy holidays. We'll talk to you next year. I promise I won't sing any more songs. Thank you. <laughs>